Hi everyone, uh, my name is Miriam and welcome back to my channel. Uh, before we proceed to the topic of the video, I want to first say thank you for all your support and the critics. I sincerely didn't expect this. I was absolutely sure that only two people will watch it, my husband and my sister, to whom I sent the link and told them not to send it to anyone else. Um, and actually, when I got the first 20 views, I was like, did you? But uh, I didn't expect uh, so many views and subscribers and I'm really grateful for all that. I read the comments and I will try to make my video more interesting and more engaging uh, for those who are criticizing it. And I will also try to answer some of the things that you found uh, not important here. So thank you so much. Uh, secondly, I've realized that reading the comments, I've realized that I didn't say anything about myself, uh, leaving you with no credible information like who I am to talk about that and why you are supposed to believe me. And it's uh, it's obviously not enough to just be one of versions and read the school books. Uh, so who I am? I uh, my name is Mila. Uh, it means mile in Russian. It's a short version for the name Amelia. I am a master in cultural studies. I graduated from Lomonosov Moscow State University, which is thought to be uh, one of the best or the best, depending on the person who's talking about it, uh, universities in Russia. I graduated at first as bachelor, specializing in the interaction between art and um, between the arts and politics in the Soviet Union, early Soviet Union. And then I did the same thing in Yugoslavia because I also speak Serbian and Croatian. So here I am. I also work as a product manager in uh, an educational company. So uh, being interested in the impact of the education is uh, not just something that is not only my hobby, it's also relevant for my job, although I work mostly with programming courses, but uh, still I am interested in how we can affect the people with the education, how it already affects us, uh, especially regarding the tragedy that we're seeing right now, and I'm talking, of course, about the war. I also could see that some of you are worried about my uh, safety and I have to assure you that everything is fine. I was thinking about it. I am lucky enough to live abroad. I had I had I moved more than a year ago to a country that is quite far away from Russia, so don't worry. Um, I have a permanent residence here because I am married to a person from this country, so everything is absolutely fine and I am not in any sort of danger. I could also see that for many people it's not that clear why I'm doing this video even and what I'm trying to deliver, which type of information I'm trying to deliver to you. I'm not trying to say that Russia is a super bad state, the worst in the world and every country ever is better. No. And what I'm trying to do here is that I see that a lot of people who support Russian accent or actions they, uh, at least in Russia, they use the same arguments over and over again. One of them is this. Мы ни с кем не хотим воевать. Россия никогда ни на кого не нападала. Это удивительно, когда великая и могучая страна Никогда ни на кого не нападала, она только защищала свои рубежи. Дай Бог, чтобы и до скончания века страна наша была такой, сильной, могучей и одновременно любимой Богом. And just to show you that it's not just uh, the Russian officials from any type uh, who are doing all that. Here is also a video of a regular citizen saying the same thing. Настравливают, понимаете? Потому что славяне, вот люди России, никогда не воевали ни с украинцами, ни с белорусами. То есть мы мирные люди, славяне, мы добродушные, мы никогда не воевали ни с кем, а нас стараются столкнуть. Но я хочу сказать, все равно русский человек сильный, 
у него и дух, и все, что нам дали с рождения, вот, мы все равно победим, и победа будет наша. I really uh, try to understand how we understood, how we got to this point where people believe in such things. And I found one of the answers in education, another one is of course in the media. So I'm trying to show you with examples of the school books, how we are taught to, to do that. Uh, some people wrote that many other countries do the same. I would love you to share the examples with me in the comments if you want. Feel free to make your own video about propaganda in school books in your countries, like, why not? Uh, I will be very happy to know that. And I will also try to use the other country's school books in, in my own videos. So, last time we were talking about how Russia was colonized in the north in quite an early Middle Ages. And today I'm going to tell you about how Russia colonized Siberia. So today we're going to talk about the colonization of Siberia. Um, colonization of Siberia, it was a long process because Siberia is, you know, was the biggest part of the country in Russia. Everything that's behind the Ural Mountains is basically the eastern, Europe, eastern part of Russia. All that was colonized for a long time. It took many years to take it because it's a big territory, also not empty. It was populated by many countries and Russia even had wars with China. And this is probably why we had this comment, and probably that's why she needs to study that. Never checked it myself. But is this person saying truth? Because we had wars uh, with, uh, not wars, like battles to get this territory, because China was also interested in colonizing this place. Okay, so for this, I took several school books, uh, and the structure will be like this. I will show you the school book. I'll show you what they say about the colonization, and I will say how it is true or not, and why it is not, and why it is. So let's get started. The first book that we're going to use today is by Chernikov. All of the books will be from the seventh grade, where children from around like 13 to 14 year old study, and we'll look at how they write about colonization. So in this book, we have uh, one chapter dedicated to the colonization of Siberia and in those in this chapter that lasts for full four pages oh my god so many uh, to cover such a big and complex process we come across a football page about the expedition of Simeon Dijnyov uh, mentions of other six expeditions of Russian pioneers to exploit to explore the territory and only guess how many din, 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 one one mention of the actual population who lived there. It even says, the quote, uh, The indigenous peoples of these lands were Daur, Ivanks, and Yves people. Russians did not have serious clashes with them, as if it's the only thing that matters, and if, as if those were the only people who lived there, which is not true. Uh, and then it is followed by a passage about the battles with Chinese army who were trying to get those lands for themselves. It's insane because later on it's it just talks about the taxes and how much the russian empire has benefited from it so although it doesn't say anything about the people uh, that used to live there and who were colonized and how they were colonized it provides the information about the division in taxes uh, russians who moved there from the metropolitan area had to pay with money they had to pay real taxes which were lower than in the metropolitan area of the country while the indigenous peoples had to pay with fur, there was a special amount of fur for each person uh, who, that they were supposed to pay. This uh, explanation is followed by a very, in my opinion, very cynical phrase. And it's not for nothing that Moscow was encouraging the expeditions of pioneers and manufacturers. In the 17th century, the income from Siberian furs amounted in a quarter of all the state income. If you think about it, if uh, the fur that the Russian Empire was getting was they were getting from the local population, which follows from these phrases, uh, it means that the indigenous population was providing a quarter of the state income. And for me, it's absolutely cynical because we don't know anything about them from the school book. I mean, literally, I looked through all other chapters, there, and there's nothing. 
uh, we don't know anything about how they got this for how many leaves we don't even have a list of all the nations that Russians used to get this huge part of the income moreover uh, we instead we just read about people who were colonizing them uh, but we don't read anything about them uh, I can't imagine being uh, a person from an indigenous uh, population that still lives in Russia and growing up and, and having my children coming home and saying like oh you know uh, we were so like they don't even mention us although you know the amount of indigenous people there was quite big so let's look at the data about all those three uh, nations that were mentioned in this book uh, because they don't mention anything else. But let's first look at the population that used to live there, other nations that were met by, that uh, Simon Dijnev at least met. At least it could have mentioned him, uh, the people that he met, since they're talking about him, but nothing there. Uh, and let's talk about the culture and the struggles of the war events and mixed peoples uh, that after they met Russians. So let's talk about what's the problem of the school book, what's the data they presented wrong, and what the data they didn't present at all. So as I guess, it's kind of obvious from how I said it in the previous section, the school book didn't talk about the population of Siberia basically at all. Uh, first of all, uh, we don't know who lived there and how many people lived there and how they actually took the colonization process. And unfortunately, it's not only the problem of this particular school book, it's also the problem of many Russian research because uh, when uh, Siberia was colonized, people didn't care much to count how many people lived there. They didn't really take care of uh, actually remembering uh, their names. And as you will see, we actually, Russians, I mean, used a lot of wrong names that for the peoples because well, they were like, people, the colonizers were not interested at all in learning how to call them. They were mostly taking other names from the other tribe, the other nations, instead of asking the particular representatives of it. So although we don't have the specific numbers, we have some estimations. And I here is the estimation from Belge, the researcher of a more region. And I took a more region because this is the specific place where those three nations that were included in the school books, uh, Ifeng, Star Wars, and Nifs, Nifs, uh lived. Uh, they lived in a more region. And according to Dolge, uh, by the moment of the colonization, this area was populated by around 21,000 people. And interesting enough, those were those nations that were mentioned in the book were not, and they are not the only nations in Siberia, and of course, not even in the Amur region. Here is the map of at least 30 nations who populated by Siberia by the 16th century. Uh, and even Dijnyov, about whom we, uh, we read a lot, met more nations, especially considering the vast territories of his expedition. Of course, those uh, those nations have their own history, which is very rich in wars and their connections and migrations and their interactions with China. But unfortunately, it hasn't been there really thoroughly studied yet because I said it's not a very trending topic, unlike the history of Russia, uh, of Russians uh, as a nation. The history of those smaller nations inside Russia is not um, of interest, uh, as I said. So let's talk about the first nation uh, that was mentioned there is Ivanks. Ivanks uh, are relatively small nations nowadays. It has a, around 77,000 people around the world with the Tungusic language group. Tungus is an exonym, which means that events don't call themselves like that. Those, it's like the names that Russians took from Yakutsk. Uh, when they met them for the first time. Historically, events were a nomad people who used many territories to hunt. 
uh, by the 17th century, when uh, Evangs uh, met Russian for the first time, they were not a united nation, rather than a collection of different clans. And they had wars between each other and the wars with other neighboring nations. So they were kind of an easy target to be attacked by Russians. But how about the serious questions? Do they even happen between those? Uh, events or Tungus people and Russians who were colonizing them. Well, uh, it's interesting because according to one of the researchers of Siberia, he, a Polish-Russian ethnographer and ex-prisoner of one of the Siberian camps, Serchevsky Vatslov Lenyevich, they were Quote, opposing to Kazakh invasion in a considerably more energetic and longer way than anybody from the Eastern Siberian nations. Yakutsk gave in almost immediately and peacefully, and repeatedly rebelled after, only under compulsion of the extremely violent and unjust attitude from the colonizers. So, instead of making a super huge war thing between Russians and the banks, they were rather doing some partisan work, trying to be independent and not pay taxes that they didn't want to pay for as long as they could. And of course, Russians were answering in a very violent way. According to the memories of the one of the pioneers, Habarov, they used to burn events, villages and kill men for fun, taking wives and cattle for their own use. Uh, and it leads us to the idea that serious clashes is a very ambiguous term. Events were fighting against the subjugation of their territories for decades. But due to the lack of unions between different clans and families, it, it, tur it never turned into some really solid war. Events were endlessly killing Kazakhs and other colonizers and representatives of the Tsar Russia and tax services in small battles and quantities, like they would kill 10-15 people at once. Except for some serious events, uh, like for example in, 19, in 1661, 92 people were sent to uh, put down those non-behaving events, and all of the soldiers died of the, in this expedition. So if you look at the history of events, it's not that peaceful, and it's not that happy, and I, I, I believe they were not that, you know, absolutely cheerful about Russian colonizers coming. But let's look at other nations, maybe it's just one small mistake and there were other nations that were happy between those three that we just looked at. So the second nation mentioned was Daurs or Dauri. Dauri was uh, by the 17th century when they met Russians for the first time, they already had rules for succession, developed agriculture with a population of around 9,800 people, and they were ruling over another nation that is not mentioned in the book and was called the Cherish, by the way, they were killing a lot of Russians and they were attacking them constantly too. But it doesn't matter, of course. The, wor the worries, serious clashes, included a lot of bloody events that were mostly caused by the hostile uh, attitude towards them by Russians. Like one of the first interactions between Russian and the worry happened in 1645 when one of the Russian pioneers, very famous one, his name is Payakov, he is very famous in Russia for attaching a more region to Russia. Here, there is even a street uh, called after him in Yakutsk, and there is even a small town called after him in Siberia. But researchers talk about serious consequences that his very violent attitude and very violent behavior made in the region. First of all, among the smaller nations of Siberia, he was famous for cannibalism. Because uh, when he met uh, Dauri for the first time, Bayakov uh, made a mistake. Before the winter, he decided to take taxes from those people that they opposed. They had a small battle, and uh, the troop of Bayakov uh, had to get close into a place that they built for themselves to spend the winter in. And because of the constant attacks of um, of Dauri and because of the hunger that they had because they didn't have a lot of food and they expected to get it more from the local population. Uh, Payerkov's people had to eat each other to survive. 
because it was winter and the bodies of their fellow soldiers who died protecting their uh, winter residence uh, they were frozen but Yarkov gave an order to eat their fellow soldier, soldiers who died according to the memories of one of the people who was a part of this um, expedition they ate during this winter at least 40 people uh, frozen and dead and uh, to survive of course this led to a very big uh, problem because according to their own memories Dalwari were absolutely terrified by those people eaters by the cannibals that came to their territory and for after the winter when they went out and decided to hunt down uh Dalwari, they had to the Dalwari were running away absolutely scared uh due to his poor decision making uh that led to the very bad relationships with the worry um in after this winter when they had to use cannibalism to survive uh he and his troop hu hunted uh, hunted down and killed at three at least three hundred uh that worry um because to punish them for refusing sharing the food with them all these expeditions results were not only getting the territories but also exploring the new areas but also it, it led to losing 73 out of 132 people of the troop and by the way it was a very good result because many other expedition troops were completely killed by the natives or they were absolutely lost in the um, in the forest the next serious clash that happened between them was 1650. Khabarov, the one that I mentioned before, who loved, who loved burning events villages. He also was quite a violent person. Uh, in his expedition, also met a lot of oppositions, mostly because of Poyakov's previous experience. Uh, don't worry, we're mostly running away from Russians or fighting back. And after a long period of fighting in 1650, his troop managed to uh, put towers to the small town, also a fortress. According to him himself, to Habarov himself, with God's help, they destroyed all Dauri. They killed altogether 661 people, adults and kids, while they killed only four Russian soldiers. Uh, according to him, also only around 20 people managed to run away from there. I believe this is a big clash enough to at least not to say that nothing happened between those nations in Russia, but okay, we have the last hope, Nifs. Nifs are arguably the oldest culture in Russian Far East. Their culture is close to Ainu, and is, their estimated population right now is around 6,000 people. It's a very small nation. There is not much information about them because the majority of Nif's population lived on Sakhalin Island that Russians started to colonize only in the middle in the mid 18th century. Anyway, there of course there were some clashes because they were expecting uh, Nif's to to send taxes which they didn't want to. But there were not so many serious ones like we had with Dongri, for example. So, and of course, because uh, Nifs were living closer to Pacifics, by the time they got there, they realized that it's not so wise to uh, to impose taxes on people right before winter because you can happen like you can end up like Poyarkov. So uh, we have less reports on killing those people and fights with them. Nevertheless, there were at least some battles with them, of course. For example, in 1656, Nifs, or as they were called back then by Russian Bilaks, attacked the troop of Anufi Stepanov and killed at least 30 soldiers. Uh, we also know, know that Nifs repeatedly became eminents, host and just like all other Siberian nations, they became eminents, hostages that were supposed to deliver the information about the region. They were used as people to show the area, they were used as people who would tell them about the, the information about them. For example, Payakov only went to Dauri because 
uh, because one of the Amanats told him that there is a place where people grow agri uh, use agriculture and they grow a lot of bread and uh, they have a very uh, good rivers to fish. So that's why. So this Amanat idea was taken from the colonization of Caucasus region and was very popular whenever Russians colonized anyone. So the conclusion for this book. Was the colonization of Siberia super peaceful? No, not really. Uh, is the student book giving the wrong information? Yes, absolutely. Is it manipulating the facts to make the impressions that Russians were peaceful? Also, absolutely yes. Uh, let's look at other books. And the next one is going to be the book by our center. So to all those people who were writing to me, especially in Russian, that I'm not able to read the historical facts and understand what's happening i hope you can because the things that i am showing to you will have the links to the research from where i got the information uh so i hope you can at least disprove me and show me where i was wrong in this in this one but let's keep going and let's go to the other textbook from the same seventh grade okay so let's go to the second book the second book was written by Arsintia. And this is surprisingly a good one, because uh, the book itself start, uh, tries to put Russia into the European context and starts with this brief description of what's the age of discovery and how Russia took part in it. At the same time, it starts to talk about the negative consequences of the age of discovery. So here is the quote. So, they promoted the fight and competition for com colonies between European countries. Colonial wars led to the deaths of huge amounts of people. Sometimes those wars got transferred to Europe too. From the new continents, Europe has got new diseases that carried away lives of many people. The European conquest of the new world has not just led to the deaths of many Indians, but also caused the loss of their original civilizations. But at the same time, when it talks about the conquest of Siberia and the colonization of Siberia, uh, this clue book doesn't talk about this, it uh, doesn't look that sad, you know? In the first part, it mentions the nations of Siberia in the scope of the inclusion of Siberian Canaanite. It says, quote, Affiliation to Russia had positive meaning to Siberian nations. They were freed from the roving attacks from other tribes, and yes, it always says tribes, Russians has taught them the, the basic agriculture, tools for it, shared the experience with them. Russia created the conditions for the development of households and culture of Siberian nations. The book, of course, doesn't stop here. It proceeds by telling us that, Russia, that the nations of Siberia that used to be a part of Siberian Hanate voluntarily became a part of Russia. It all, but I guess, based on what I told you before, uh, talking about the first uh, example of this school book, it's like it already looks dubious right um but talking about the nations that were part of siberian hanate were the biggest two of them were mansi and hanty uh there is not really much data about those two nations although we still even have a big region called after them yeah but about the colonization there is not really much data because all historians they concentrate on the war with tatars uh nevertheless we have Mansi Epos, uh, and this Epos has a lot of songs of the battles with Russians where they explicitly say they, that they want to be free and that the only way that they are going to be free is when they are free from both Tatars and Russians. So it's, it doesn't look like they really, all of them, really wanted to become part of Russia. And talking about the second nation, Hanthi, there is uh, also data on many Hanthi rebellion rebellions in the first decades of Russian rule, which is caused by them not wanting to pay taxes to Russian uh, government. Uh, the first part of this book, because it has several parts and the conversation is covered in the first two parts, is finished by the questions, which include this, the following one. How did the life of the new nations that joined Russia change? And the only answer provided by the book, it basically came better, which is a very disputable point. Like, we can really argue about this, if it's true or not. 
uh, but when the book talks about the Western civilizations, of course, it stresses how badly they treated the indigenous nations and talks about the colonization. The second part of the same book uh, looks way more inclusive. First of all, it talks about the existence of culture of such nations. It says that all of them had different cultures, which is already a good point for the book. At the same time, it stresses the different stages of development. It says uh, that they were on the lower, on the lower ones uh, compared to Russia. It even puts the word towns into quotation when it in quotation marks when it talks about the old towns, uh, like for example this one that was fully eliminated by Khabarov. It also mentions uh, that there were some conflicts, which is a very good point for a Russian scholar, but it says that those conflicts were caused by individuals rather than the process of colonization itself. It stresses that, like for example, it says that um, indigenous people suffered from the greedy merchants who were buying things cheaply, instead of saying that the indigenous people were suffering from forced Christianization, mass murders, and the regular kidnapping of people. At the same time, surprisingly, it talks about kidnapping of people. It, it explains the word amanat and even puts it as a word that children should learn, uh, talking about uh, the history. Uh, amanat is, as I told you, the special institute of hostages, which guarantee, um, which are the guarantee of getting taxes from people. But it, although it talks about this institution and regularly mentions it, it doesn't talk about it as something negative. It rather just says that they were the guarantee and it wasn't like a normal practice there and doesn't talk about how it affected the relationships with the natives. And of course, of course, the Russian book couldn't go without a comparison with the Western colonization process. It says, the quote, The majority of Taiga and Tundra Russian troops passed without serious opposition. Unlike European colonizers in America, Russian Cossacks and settlers didn't drive out or eliminate aboriginals. Look how they put this. American colonizers, Russian settlers. Um, Russian troops passed without serious opposition. European colonizers were destroying the original civilizations. All this, of course, is um, it doesn't leave much room for children to make some uh, independent point of view, and I can't imagine uh, being, let's say, one of Burats and reading about how peaceful it became uh, part of Russia, or like being the descendant of uh, Tungusic people and thinking like, oh, right, we didn't suffer at all. Uh, but was this conversation really peaceful? Apart from those things that I said to you, I want to stress out some other uh, facts uh, that I didn't mention before because I was talking only about some specific nations. Um, yeah, like there were some nations that just didn't agree to become part of Russia, like some part. Some nations like Delaware eventually fled to China entirely, they don't leave in territory of Russia anymore. Some of them had real wars like, for example, Chukchis and Karaks, Karaks, who didn't become a part of Russia until 1778. Um, and all this time, since the beginning of the colonization, uh, till 1778, they were having constant fights with uh, Russia, first Rus Russia as Russia, and then the Russian Empire. There was even a decree by Empress Elizabeth in 1742 to totally expel them from their native lands and erase their culture through war, which uh, was a part of the war that lasted from 1727 till 1778. So, like, more than 50 years. It was a very bloody war, um, which Russians... It had two campaigns, and the first one, Russia lost, by the way. And surprisingly for me, it was surprising because when I was reading documents about that, uh, it was very interesting to see that Russians call the native people of Siberia outlanders. It's like... But you are the outlanders, but it doesn't matter, of course. So we can conclude that Arsenev's book, although it provides way more information about the um, nations, uh, the way it structures, it still puts Russian culture uh, as the more important one. For example, there is a specific paragraph about Russian culture and another paragraph 
about the culture of nations inside Russia, so it puts this hierarchy, obviously. Uh, and also it still teaches children that uh, the colonization process was very, very peaceful, uh, especially compared to the European one. And this is a very, very hard point because this is a thing that is still used today. I'll talk about this more in the end of the video, obviously, but we still have this idea that Russians are better than other countries, of course, and that's why I'm making, I'm making this video. And one of them is here. Russia was not um, destroying other cultures. Which uh, the last book that I want to talk about is uh, from the same editor that I told you about the last video, uh, Vladimir Nijinsky, uh, the ex-minister of culture and the historian who sees uh, the educational process as a very powerful source of propaganda. I will probably want to make a separate video about him, but right now let's concentrate on this school book. Well, first of all, his book has only one part and it has 263 pages, only six of which are dedicated to the whole process of colonization. There is not a single word about the deaths of colonizers or the deaths that ha they have brought to Siberia. It also, like the previous one, emphasizes the age of each tribe, as they call it. Uh, an important question that raises from all those three books that I have talked about uh, is the, the question of was Siberia even colonized? None of the books that I have quoted use the word colonization. In fact, even some contemporary articles uh, published in Russian language explain why the authors believe that Siberia was colonized, uh, uh, rather than just using the word like God territories or absorbed, which is used in most of the uh, books for children. Generally, some public figures in Russia or journalists, uh, they deny the colonial st status of Siberia, Caucasia, and Middle Asia, saying that, as, uh, and they provide different arguments um, to prove their point of view. And number one, is that the lands were joined after the special agreement with the local nations. But, for example, the special legal procedure to join the land was used in all empires. It was a special, it was an absolutely normal process. It included, like, either reading a letter from the king or, like, yeah, signing some special uh, type of a paper, like they did in Russia. So this is... Um, not a thing. Second, uh, Siberia was not separated from European part of Russia by sea or any type of water. Uh, uh, and this, they believe, is uh, an argument why Russia can't be a, a colonial empire, except for Alaska. Alaska was usually is usually taken as a colony that was eventually sold to America. Um, but the problem is that the territories, the amount of territories that separate the metropolis, like the, the, the capital Moscow and uh, Siberia, especially the Far East, and especially considering the speed that uh, the vehicles from the time could produce, it was like enormous distance, which took really long time to cross. So, for example, authors like Epkin, they provide special terms for such uh, type of colonization. But also, uh, like, Roman Empire also colonized parts in Europe, which were not separated by sea, but still would take it as colonization. I, uh, I don't see any difference between that. Number three. The local nations kept their traditions and religious beliefs and language. And... Unlike the Western civilizations who are just coming and destroying the nations there. Well, it is not always true. The first Christianization took place in Russia, it took place not from the beginning, it took place mostly in the 18th century, but it did take place. Uh, the languages are slowly dying, we have a lot of dying languages, especially in the recent epoch one, um, and especially after the Soviet Union, and also the population of Siberia 
no matter of their uh, nationality has had to in the past and has to still learn Russian and use it in their everyday conversation and communication with people and that's why many countries out of the Soviet Union are still they still speak Russian many of the people like in Uzbekistan in Tajikistan or in Kazakhstan the number four argument is very popular it says that native people of Siberia were never enslaved, unlike the Russian population itself. I'm not sure you know about this, but Russia had a specific institution called serfdom. It's basically the same as slavery. They were using Russian village population as slaves. They, were, they could sell them, they could buy them. Uh, sometimes torture them to death, use them to produce goods. This uh, only existed in European part of Russia. It was not ever introduced in the north of Russia or in Siberia. And especially it was prohibited to convert Siberian nations to serfs. Although in reality it also happened. And this is used as an argument that uh, native population of Siberia were never colonized because they were not enslaved. But first, like, yes, they were enslaved. Like, for example, you can look at those portraits which show uh, the owners and their, and their um, serfs. Uh, you can also look at Brazilian experience where the prohibition of enslavement also existed and also didn't really work in the reality. Um, the only difference and the only reason why the um, why the natives were not uh, enslaved officially and was officially prohibited is because they were a direct source of fur, which was the main export of Russia back then, and me that meant that they were working directly for the king, uh, I mean Tsar, and then the emperor, and that's what that means that they were a direct source for economy in Russia. So, why does that even matter? Like, it happened so much time ago. Why do we care if Siberia was colonized? If it's if they suffered back then, like in 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, that actually happened in 18th, 19th, and in the 20th too, and still happens. But why does that matter? Like, why am I talking about such old things? Well, first of all, because the idea that Russia is better than other Western countries because it never colonized anybody, just like never attacked anybody, um, is still used. For example, uh, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs in Russia, uh, Sergei Lavrov, in, in an article for African Media, has written the following, which was tweeted by Minister of Foreign Affairs in Russia. Russia never guilt-stained with the bloody crimes of colonialism has always supported Africans in their fight against the colonial oppression. We are sympathetic with the demands to finish the process of colonization. So this type of argument is still being used in Russia, even by such serious authorities like Sergei Lavrov. Also, this lack of education on the colonization process results in such propaganda Mistakes like this one, for example. Для понимания, что из себя представляла Елизавета на кадрах королева в молодости. Вот так она кормила детей из числа порабощенных народов Африки. Посмотрите на эту доброту, словно бы животные в зоопарке. Ну и данное видео олицетворяет собой отношение Запада и англосаксов, в частности, ко всем в этом мире, кроме, разумеется, самих же себя. Of course, it is used right now as an argument to prove that Russia never attacked anybody. They say, look at Europe, what they were doing in, in Congo, what they were doing in Americas, what they were doing in other African countries. Right in Australia, we almost never talk about Australia, but uh, sometimes even this. Uh, and they say, and if you say like, oh, but what were you doing in Russia? They say like, nothing. Well, why would you ask? 
we don't do anything there we only make the nations there happy and this is a very hard point and that's why i believe it should be changed in the school books it also one of the things that i believe are derived from this poor education that we have is the constitutional change in 2020 two years ago uh, it directly says that uh, Russian language is the main language of the country because it's the language of the state forming nation. And of course, it leads to everyday racism. Russia is a very racist country, if you, and if you don't know about it, like even Russians still say that we're not racist, but unfortunately, Russia is a very racist country. One of the big examples is that many uh, people, landlords only rent their flats to people who look like Slavs and it's a very typical thing to have problems if you don't look like a Slav when you rent an apartment. It's literally written there, I will only rent it to Slavs, Slav families. So, and one uh, Belarusian comic, Ithak Mertalice, uh, who has like non-Slav origins uh, has made a joke about this saying that assuming that he can also make assumptions based on one interaction with Slavs he was not just imprisoned for 15 days he was also banned from Russia till 2035 here is the extract of his joke Как сделать так, чтобы жилье мне досталось? Во-первых, первый пункт плана – это сказать как можно больше слов по телефону до имени, чтобы риэлтор запомнил, что я говорю без акцента. Ему это нужно запомнить, потому что если я сразу скажу имя, акцент он дорисует по-любому. Если я скажу «Здравствуйте, меня зовут Идрак», он дальше услышит «Хочу квартиру». Сразу все-таки «О, здорово, здорово», я говорю «Меня зовут Идрак», он «Иди нахуй». Матрас с братом выкидываю, который тоже не русский. Матрас? Матрас очень даже русский. Я его выбрасываю, он весь в г***е. Ладно, не нужно было говорить. Если что, предыдущие съемки русские, и, видимо, русские обмазываются г***ем и ложатся спать. A very similar scandal happened a few, day, a few years ago when the Jewish Museum and Tolerance Center um, hired a company, an HR company, to make a job posting for them to uh, hire people for the cafe inside the museum. Uh, the company just followed the standard procedure and posted it saying that they will only hire people who look like Slavs in the Tolerance Center. And also, of course, it's like things that we usually don't talk about about in Russia like for example here is the interview of a woman who currently is working for Netflix but she's originally from the Caucasus area in Russia and here is the interview where she mentions the problems the racism that she faced when she used to live in Moscow поступила да. в МГУ. Москва вообще в целом было супер тяжёлое время. Что было а... самого ужасного в Москве? Что тебя вначале поразило? Когда ты еще совсем как бы ребенок, еще с лицом кавказской национальности, то это совсем сложно. Я жила в общежитии МГУ, меня часто останавливали милиционеры, сажали там в Кутузку, и там, если у меня не было с собой там какого-то паспорта или э, московской прописки. И когда ты живешь в одной культуре, и Дагестан это такое, это, мне кажется, самое, ну, как бы отличающееся республика своей культурой от вообще всей России. Это вообще не Россия. Когда ты выходишь оттуда и приезжаешь э, в Москву или в любой другой город и видишь, что люди, не знаю, держатся за руки, да, такого никогда не увидишь в Дагестане. Или когда, ну, как они себя ведут, как растет детей, вообще, как это все, это все совсем все по-другому, и ты притираешься, и постепенно ты становишься уже таким своим, уже больше москвичом, чем больше Дагестан, дагестанкой. Но вот, например, у меня всегда было, когда первые годы я в самолет садилась, аэрофлот, садилась в самолет, чтобы лететь вот там из Нью-Йорка в Москву. И вот только ты заходишь в самолет, там все уже русскоговорящие в Москву летят, то прямо на мне ярлык появляется, лицо кавказской национальности. Вот прям его нет, вот я вот захожу, и он появляется, потому что я понимаю, что эти люди, которые меня видят, они сразу думают, что лицо из Кавказа, да? В Америке этого нет совершенно. То есть я тут 
кто угодно, пока я не открою рот, уж как только ты говоришь, что сразу славянский акцент, вот. Но я могу быть гречанкой, итальянкой, просто там индийкой, не знаю, кем угодно. То есть вот вообще у меня нет такого, что на мне ставят сразу клеймо. Вот. В России на мне сразу есть клеймо, особенно если я не нарядная, не накрашенная, не вся такая пределе, тогда может быть, может быть, как бы там, не знаю, может быть и там какая-то, как вот сейчас говорят, не знаю, меня как угодно называли, я не знаю, как меня называли, ужасные слова, но я это чувствую на себе, я чувствую, что Скажи, только... ты когда жила в России, да. в Москве, да. ты чувствовала на себе вот этот буллинг? Конечно, есть, конечно. Как, что это на улице, в метро люди тебя оскорбляют? А, у меня много было ситуаций, когда старые люди, бабульки сидели в троллейбусе, и мне прям в глаза говорили, что вы понаехали, что вы тут делаете, моя подружка из Бурятии стоит рядом, то есть она из Бурятии, ездит из Кавказа, вот, и просто ну, вот самые ужасные слова говорит, вот, самое страшное Страшный момент был, когда я был уже поздно, и я ехала в метро, и был пустой э, поезд, и там были подростки. И подростки, мне кажется, когда они такие безбашенные, это самое ужасное. Вот. И я просто сидела, они сели вокруг меня все, и они вот говорили ужасные вещи, я до сих пор помню. Мне было, наверное, лет 18. Вот. А, и я просто, я думала, я там умру от страха, и я молчала, потому что я понимала, если я хоть слово скажу, там просто я не выживу. Это, это сложно тебе понять, потому что у тебя лицо славянской национальности, но мне кажется, это это очень, вот я сейчас понимаю вот эти BLM movements, да, здесь про чернокожих, я очень хорошо понимаю, я здесь совершенно не чернокожая, но когда, темнокожая, но когда я в России, да, Ты то я должна вот это себя держать, потому что здесь, например, да, вот они говорят, часто говорят, например, там, чернокожий парень, какой бы он умный, богатый, прекрасный не был, да, он не может просто надеть какой-то вот просто вот встал утром какие-то там штанишки, худи, да, и пойти в аптеку, да, потому что сразу о нем будут думать, что там криминал, какой-то вот какие-то стереотипы. То же самое в России. Особенно если ты в какой-то от центра Москвы где-то подальше, да, и ты какой-то не супер нарядный, и так сразу же все, на тебе клеймо, и это такой стереотип, супер плохой стереотип, да, и мне кажется, особенно у мужчин это еще хуже. А, к сожалению, это так, а здесь этого нет, и я прям очень рада, что а, здесь этого нет, вот. And of course, such ideas, the fact that we don't talk about racism in Russia, the fact that we don't believe that we used to be, that we still have colonies inside the country, and, um, just ignoring the, those problems leads to several to many problems of those people like for example uh banning of learning the native language of those people even in national republics now it's not now it, no, no it's just not uh, obligatory for anyone and uh, that of course decreases the number of people who speak and study these languages so they die even faster Like, for example, look here is the statistic of people taking the national language of Tatarstan. And you can see how it's decreasing with years after taking this law. Um, the argument against it is that why do I have to learn, let's say, Buryat language if I'm a Russian? But why do, what, it never occurs to Russian people that why do Buryats need to speak Russian if they are not Russian? Um, unfortunately, it also occurs in other things, like for example, when people from ex-Soviet republics want to migrate to Russia, now they will have to probably go through special adaptational centers that was uh, supported by Putin just a few days ago. A uh, quote from Putin, he said that when foreigners need to come, come to Russia, they must learn our traditions, language and culture. But the question is, which culture traditions uh, are they going to learn? Are they going to learn the uh, Kalmyk traditions maybe? Are they going to learn anything about Buddhism which is very widespread in Buryatia or are they going to maybe talk about shamanism spread in Yakutia? And no of course we're only talking about Russian culture here not even Ukrainian not even other Slav based um, Culture is not even Kazakh culture, just Russian culture from the metropolis. So the question is, do we really make those nations thrive, and do we really help them and make the um, and make the surroundings for them to make their cultures grow, or do we just abuse their territories and the people in there to produce fossil fuel to sell to the West? This. 
Okay, so that's more or less it. Uh, please share your thoughts about what I'm talking about here in the video in the comment section. I will also post the, all the links and um, the time codes in the description box below. And please, because I, I want to dedicate my next video to talking about the Western books. So if you're from the country that either was colonized or that colonized someone else, because it's basically the whole world, please uh, send me the extracts from your school books uh, so I can easily analyze them and yeah, produce the next video faster and sorry for the delay, I was just unfortunately I had to do this after work or in the weekends um, because I, I still have to work <laughs> thank you very much, see you in the next video finishing this video I have to highlight the fact that I didn't cover even like a half of the nations that live in Siberia and their clashes and their stories of colonization. Unfortunately, for such a relatively short video, it's very hard to cover everything. But what I uh, try to show is that the general tendency is the fall in Russia doesn't just like in the current politics, when Russia is like attacking Ukraine, for example, and just says that it's not an attack, it's just a military operation for which we suddenly started to have need a mobilization of the population. All of that has deep roots in how Russia represents its history and uh, how it just says no to anything that is like frowned upon in contemporary history, like killing native population or like racism or whatever russia just says that it never existed in its territory and just like right now russians say that they are not uh discriminating against ukrainians they are not uh, uh, even though the ukrainian flag is basically prohibited in the territory of russia just like that russia is also saying that the military operation doesn't the there is a military operation, not a war.